This is part of the ongoing series of interviews uh, sponsored by the Archives Committee of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. Today we're at the Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm Dr. Robert Ogeman, and I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Juan Tavares today. Uh, Dr. Tavares, uh, I think, considered without question the father of neuroradiology uh, in America. We've been particularly honored to have him as a member of our staff here for the last several years. I thought I'd begin, Juan, by asking you just a little bit about your, your background, uh, how you got into medicine, and uh, then we'll go on from there. Yes, that's, that's an interesting uh, way to start. I, um, I was born in uh, a little town called Moca in Dominican Republic and uh, went to um, the uh, little town of Moca uh, in the uh, grade and high school. And my parents um, always thought that um, I had shown uh, uh, good ability in school and they, showed, they thought that I should go into medicine because of that. They had good judgment. <laughs> so, uh, uh, as, it, as I graduated from high school, but it's only natural, I just went to the university and that was prepared for medical school and, and went actually and got my MD degree uh, from um, the University of Santo Domingo to start with. And then uh, immediately thereafter, I um, came to the United States on a fellowship, which uh, interestingly enough was uh, granted by the U.S. Public Health Service. And so I came here. Where, where are we now chronologically? When was well, that? Chronologically, we are, I'm talking about uh, 1944. So that must have been one of the very early fellowships that the Public Health Service sponsored. Yes, that, that was, and I'll have to say that that was given through a branch that was uh, particularly interested in helping Latin Americans. Mm -hmm. So that um, it was given by that branch, a branch of the Public Health Service that was created, uh, I think, either during the war or very shortly before the war, uh, World War II started. <clears throat> and um, I think that that was a very useful uh, thing for, for the American government to, to do at the time. At any rate, I came uh, here and I went to the University of Pennsylvania and uh, to study radiology. And uh, then, um, I finished my training, which was four years, and it turned out that at that time I couldn't go back to the uh, Dominican Republic because of uh, political problems with my family had gotten involved in. So uh, I was sort of an exile, and then I, so I, it came over that I needed to get my license to practice medicine, and I couldn't because of the things were not very well organized at that time. So uh, I went to medical school again at the again. University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, so I have two MD degrees. I did not, I only had to go for one more year mm -hmm. over here. It was interesting because at that time I was listed as assistant instructor in radiology in the Graduate School of Medicine in one catalog and in the other catalog I was listed as a medical student. Oh, that must be unique. <laughs> so you uh, then, after the graduation from the radiology program and from medical school, uh, what happened? Then, there? then I went to um, to Columbia Presbyterian mm -hmm. as a uh, junior staff radiologist, and it is there that uh, I had the. Uh, opportunity to spend time with Dr. Ernest Wood. Uh, that was the early 50s, 1950, 51. 
uh, at the Neurological Institute in uh, New York. He was then the director of neuroradiology at the Neurological Institute. And it turned out that um, Dr. Wood decided to accept the chairmanship of the Department of Radiology at the newly created medical school at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So he went there as chairman and I was asked to become the director of radiology at the Neurological Institute. That was 1952 and um, then at that time um, I immediately began to get some ideas as to what needed to be done to improve the uh, equipment uh, situation there and um, to uh, try to improve the teaching and, uh, and so forth. So that happened uh, uh, early in 19... Uh, in the, in the 1950 to 60 decade. Right, now before we get on with that, was, the, was there anything during your radiology training or when you went to Columbia that particularly attracted you or got you uh, guided into the area of the nervous system? I'll, I'll have to say that um, it did not happen uh, that way and um, I got interested when I went to, when I was sent as a junior staff member in radiology as a sort of a fellowship type of uh, <clears throat> junior, junior fellows, because at that time there were not too many fellows in radiology. So that was a way to get some postgraduate training was to, you got your junior assistant mm -hmm. appointment. So I was there as a fellow, you might say, equivalent in the Neurological Institute, and that's where I became interested in, in the field. Otherwise, I might have ended up in uh, some other area of radiology. Well, we're fortunate for that uh, association. You, now, might, you might say that it's a matter of being in the right place at the right time, <laughs> perhaps. Now, you uh, have had occasion to look at the history of neuroradiology before we we go on with what happened after the 50s, and you've uh, pointed out that, in fact, uh, uh, neurosurgery and neurosurgeons uh, have been a, uh, often a guiding force in the uh, early uh, years of radiology as it related to the nervous system, and uh, neurosurgeons, of course, seeing a need for that would push for that. Would you want to perhaps uh, summarize a little bit of what you think the high points of, of that uh, uh, aspect would be well very much so I uh, very I agree that neurosurgery was responsible for most of the developments in the uh, field uh, and uh, uh, starting uh, with uh, with Dandy who uh, uh, described the use of air as a contrast medium to visualize the brain and the spinal cord, as a matter of fact, in 1918 and 1919, that is considered as the most important uh, development uh, in, uh, in the field because at that time there was no other way of visualizing the brain and all we had was the skull films. And um, that then uh, was one development. Then I'll have to say that there are two other developments that were uh, actually produced by uh, neurologists. One of them was Sicard, Jean Sicard, from Fr French, who developed uh, uh, contrast uh, myelography mm -hmm. using a positive contrast medium. And Egas Moniz, who uh, uh, developed uh, cerebral angiography. But I'll have to say that Egas Moniz received considerable assistance from his uh, neurosurgical uh, associate, uh, Almeida Lima, who later wrote an important book in uh, diagnostic uh, in, uh, angiography of the brain. Um, but in addition to, um, to these uh, uh, developments, um, the, uh, uh, when you take, for example, the, when ultrasound came, <coughs> 
ultrasound was first applied by Lexell, a neurosurgeon in, uh, in Sweden. And he was responsible for the uh, uh, development uh, or, the, or the clinical uses of ultrasound in the nervous system, um, it, which at that time was very much needed, as, as you know. And uh, then when you came to other future developments like the intervention of neurobiological procedures, that was also originated by a neurosurgeon. Uh, and we might discuss that uh, later, but uh, Lesson was, was, right. was responsible for this, the early development uh, of this. And um, as we go back, uh, it is uh, the, uh, the neurosurgeons who uh, caused these developments to take place because they needed it. Now, we could go back all the way uh, to the uh, 1800s, 18, uh, before 1895, uh, <clears throat> when there was no way, no, there were no, no, radio, no radiography and nothing, so the only thing that they had was a clinical indication of where the lesion might be. And um, then uh, Rengen came, and uh, then the discovery of x-rays, and that added a new dimension. Uh, but only, only skull films were made between 1895 and uh, 1918. <clears throat> and uh, there was very uh, little that could be done except to see things like the enlargement of the cell of Tersica. And Cushing, of course, perhaps one of the reasons why he got interested in uh, pituitary surgery was because he could see these lesions as they produced changes in the skull films. And um, you could also see calcified lesions in the brain. And that's about and all you could see. And then you could see hyperostosis from meningiomas and calcifications uh, in the brain and destruction of bone and things like that. Speaking of Cushing, I believe in, in uh, his uh, biography, the first spinal x-ray, or the first x-ray taken at Hopkins was a spinal x-ray on a patient with a gunshot wound of the spinal cord that was one of the things that, or one of the patients and one of the encounters that steered Cushing toward neurosurgery. Which is interesting because he was not a neurosurgeon then. Right, he was, he was a, a, that was part of his general surgery. Right, and so uh, he, um, he actually uh, uh, published the first uh, application of uh, x-rays to detect a lesion in the spinal cord which led to paralysis. And, and that was his first publication, too, in, yep. that uh, he ever, uh, ever wrote. Well, let's uh, go back now to the 1950s. Uh, uh, you had a few uh, techniques available at that time to help you, but uh, my first encounter with neurosurgery was in 1957, and as I recall, angiography was still in a rather primitive state then, single films or two or three films being pulled by hand, uh, myelography uh, done uh, with, I believe, Panopec at that point, but there's still occasional use of Thoratrast, and uh, perhaps you could uh, describe for us what went on in that, that first decade of your um, encounter with neuroradiology as you were beginning to see the needs for training and the needs for development of new equipment, as you mentioned earlier. Yes, that, that period in the 1950s was, was a very important, uh, very important period of time because um, there, I was the only full-time neuroradiologist in the United States. There was no other one. Dr. Wood had been, but then he left and became a chairman of a department uh, elsewhere. And the, uh, I saw the need to uh, sell the idea of, uh, of training in this field of medicine. And um, I'll say the following. At that time, angiography was 
was uh, frequently used, but um, the, uh, the way that angiography was carried out was, as you indicated, uh, with uh, single films, or maybe three films, one after the other. Pulled, pulled by remember. hand. That's right, yes, yes. Uh, I remember, shoot, pull, shoot, pull. <laughs> and uh, interestingly enough, by 1952 uh, uh, to 53 over there, I began using routinely the Fairchild camera. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were doing, for the rest of the 1950s, routinely, the first, I think, in, in the world, we're using routinely mm -hmm. the Fairchild camera to take serial line geography uh, in both the lateral projection and in the frontal projection at the Neurological Institute that was in New York. And I noticed that uh, elsewhere that was not the case. Mm -hmm. It took a number of years before that, uh, that developed. The uh, um, uh, myelography was, was uh, utilized uh, uh, very frequently because it's, it was the only way that we had to diagnose both intervertebral discs, uh, herniations, and uh, um, the, uh, the intraspinal lesions. And I think that um, uh, pantopaque was a fairly good contrast medium, and it lasted for a long time. I think that probably pantopaque has now finally died. Um, and But the other thing was that Pneumography was uh, still very heavily utilized. And at that time, I remember all of the talks, the conferences, and I was invited to attend and uh, give some uh, lectures on uh, what they called the small pneumoencephalogram, <laughs> which consisted in the injection of a small amount of contrast media instead of Five, mass, five cc's yeah, or ten cc's five, of air. Ten, fifteen, slowly, little by little, mm -hmm. as against the massive amounts that uh, were used before, where they emptied the entire brain cavity and the patient was extremely sick uh, after that, uh, and so forth. And ventriculography was slowly decreasing as angiography became better. But still to, used a lot for posterior fossa. We still use it for the posterior fossa and, and so forth because the vertebral angiography was uh, was not so. And, and uh, all the good. angiography was was direct puncture in the neck at that yes, time. All of it was uh, direct puncture of the carotid and direct pun puncture of the vertebra, mm -hmm. which was not an easy trick very often. The patients all had uh, complications uh, uh, often, as you as you. Remember, probably, the, um, there was a certain percentage of hemiplegias that occurred um, as a result of, uh, of the arteriogram. Well, then, uh, as the uh, 60s came along, uh, what were the, the next uh, developments well, during that? By the way, just before leaving angiography, I'll, I'll, I'd like to say that another thing that was lacking at that time was good contrast media. And we were using thorotrast mm -hmm. and later and also diodrast. Diodrast was not very good because sometimes it produced convulsions and it was not very opaque. Finally, in the late 50s, we did get the good contrast media, which is called hypake, mm -hmm. and then its variations and Conray and so forth after that. And that was uh, a, an important reason why angiography developed more slowly than it should have. We just didn't have good contrast media. I may also say that uh, it was in the 1950s, actually, in 53, uh, when the first paper was published by Seldinger on the uses of catheter uh, to do, to replace the needle. But yet it took 10 years to 11 years before we replaced finally the needle with the catheter. So it was well into the, six, in the, the early 60s before the catheter techniques really. Uh, That's right. And that occurred very slowly. 
that we, mm-hmm. most of everybody continue to do the punctures in the neck. And uh, then by the late 1960s, I think it was the catheter techniques were really taking hold. But again, that requires a lot of development, not only techniques, but the materials, mm-hmm. the flexible catheters and the thin catheters and so forth. So that um, the development of, this, of, the, uh, 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 of the field of angiography uh, continued well into the, the 60s and the early 70s. And at that time, we were doing what we call super selective angiography where we could almost get into the ophthalmic artery I mean, that to, to, do the, to do a little injection of a tiny amount and things of that sort. That uh, got better later on. Mm-hmm. And then, as you know, uh, considerable changes took place in the 70s. Right, before we get on to the, the 70s, uh, it's going back to myelography. Now that stayed pretty stationary, I guess, during the 60s. Uh, still using Panopec and pretty standard techniques. Uh, when did uh, cisternography using uh, isotope uh, injections uh, really come into uh, to use? Uh, was that during the, that period of yes, time? Yes, cisternography um, using uh, isotopes with, uh, to start with, that uh, came in um, Probably uh, uh, in the 19, uh, in the early 1970s, uh, late 1960s, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> there was the description, as you know, of the um, uh, you know, normal tensive hydrocephalus. And I think that gave a real push to the idea mm-hmm. of doing systematography with, with um, uh, uh, radioactive materials. Because cisternography, of course, uh, was, was uh, and had received considerable attention with air. Mm-hmm. Pneumocisternography right. was part of pneumocephalography. And as you know, we got fairly sophisticated. Careful study of the cisterns was an important part of that. That's right. It was very sophisticated because we could also do tomography. Mm-hmm. We could do tomography. Uh, and get a very good uh, detail uh, of that. The, uh, for example, the, the tomography in the region of the supracellular region, I have exquisite detail uh, on my, some of my old slides from pneumoencephalography, um, which compare now with what we are getting uh, with uh, magnetic resonance mm-hmm. imaging. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, a cisternography with uh, uh, radiopaque contrast again had a rebirth, you might say, when the water soluble contrast media for myelography were uh, developed. Right. Again, that was in the 70s. Yes. Well, now coming to the 70s, of course, the, the big uh, event there was the CT scan. And can you perhaps, from your perspective, uh, recount? Uh, how you uh, first uh, uh, were associated with that uh, equipment? Well, that, I'll have to say, was a startling discovery. I think everybody agrees. And uh, the way that I was introduced to it, it uh, was as follows. Uh, I was uh, on the faculty of a postgraduate course, uh, which was, by the way, at the Albert Einstein uh, Medical Center by doc- uh, organized by Dr. Schechter, Manny Schechter, mm-hmm. that you may know his name. Uh, and uh, Dr. James Bull uh, was on the faculty. And he- He was uh, from Queen Square. Uh, from James Bull from Queen Square, was a director of neuroradiology there. And um, the, uh, the a startling announcement was made, and presentation was made at the meeting of the British Institute of Radiology in London, right at that time, at the end of April. And um, 
Dr. Bull, who was coming here, thought that it would be a good idea to bring the inventor of this new technique, uh, Dr. Godfrey, Godfrey Hounsfield. He's not a doctor, actually. He's Godfrey Hounsfield. Yes, he's an engineer, a physicist. Um, bring him over to demonstrate this new uh, development in England. And there I was, startled. He was showing tumor after tumor and this and that. He just said, my God, <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. So I immediately went to him and said, how about coming to the Massachusetts General Hospital? I said, when, my, when we leave here, I'm leaving here to, tomorrow. Can you come with me? He said, yeah, I'll come with you. So he came with me. And uh, he spent two days over here. We were kind of squeezing all of, all of the ideas that he had and so forth. and. Um, so um, the result was that uh, we immediately started working on that uh, to try to get a grant from the NIH. But at the same time, within two weeks, I was in England ordering a, uh, the new machine. So um, I, um, I went there, and uh, the, uh, I placed an order for the unit. And I have to say uh, that. The trustees uh, here backed me up, and uh, they saw that it was a good idea to go ahead and so forth. And I went over there, and they ordered it, and, and there it was. It was delivered then uh, within about eight months or nine months. It was mm -hmm. uh, delivered uh, here the following year. 19, this was 1972, and it was delivered in 1973. Actually, probably the first two instruments were de delivered here, one of them in the Mayo Clinic and the other one here, almost simultaneously. No, yeah. no question about the importance of that, everyone would agree. And, and then it seemed like almost every year or less there were uh, improvements in that equipment, it just, uh, 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 by leaps and bounds. Oh yeah, that, the, um, the first uh, uh, equipment that was that we had here. It took five minutes to generate two images. There were two images simultaneously, two slices, and um, the patient's head was surrounded by a bag of, of water that compressed the head, which served to immobilize it. But also, it was needed by the by the computer, and it took five minutes to generate two slices, and then. Uh, within, within two years, by 1975, um, we, uh, we had what they, uh, a, what they call a body uh, unit that was capable of, of uh, examining the entire body. Mm -hmm. And we got one uh, here, which also allowed us to examine the head as well as the body. It turned out that it was not as good for the head as the old head unit was. And then the other thing that happened was the, the exposure time was 20 seconds to 25 seconds instead of five minutes. <laughs> Shows you already what that uh, transpired. And then by uh, 1978 or so, three years later, we already had units that were capable of 10 second uh, exposure. And then that kept on going, and then we were, we were down to one second now. And in the 70s, you mentioned earlier, a water-soluble uh, contrast was developed for myelography and cisternography. And uh, then uh, that started to be used in conjunction with CT scan as well. Uh, did that all happen fairly rapidly, or was that a slow uh, process of the the development of the, uh, those contrasts? That, that, uh, that, would, that took place within a period of about two years. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually done in Scandinavia. In Norway was where most of the uh, work was done. Um, and um, the uh, Winthrop Company, uh, with that, I think, bought the, the rights. And uh, so they, they started distributing that in the United States. That was, I think, uh, an important advance. Um, so we were not only able to do myelography with it, but also 
we were able to do cystinography so that we could um, get the contrast medium into the uh, head and then we do cross sections which um, were actually uh, excellent. Uh, we could do them with um, uh, the polytone unit, mm -hmm. the polytone unit that is plain films. And uh, with much less contrast, they could also be done with, uh, with, cat, with the CAT scan, mm -hmm. computer tomography. It so happened, though, that the computer tomography did not need it, so we, it never really became very uh, popular. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> over a period of, after the, um, the, the, uh, the resolution of the computer tomography unit continued to improve, uh, then it turned out that uh, uh, the uh, cystinography disappeared. Right. Now, uh, then the MRI scan and your introduction to that. Well, that's another interesting uh, story. Um, you see, the, uh, as you know, magnetic resonance, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, they call them, uh, had been used in chemistry uh, since the late 1940s. And I think it was in 1952 that uh, Purcell here from Harvard and Bloch from uh, Stanford, uh, who had simultaneously uh, described this, although Purcell's paper came out first. Uh, but anyway, they both received recognition and they split the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. in 1952. But um, then in 1972, we had the dis description of computer tomography and how you could convert the uh, absorption coefficients of the X-rays as they go through the tissues uh, into images by calculating with the computer. Well, in 1973, only a year later, Paul Lauterbohr from New York described uh, how it would be possible to place in space where the magnetic resonance uh, of the nuclei was coming from, because he already mm -hmm. got the idea from the computer demography. So that was taken up by some more in England, I'll have to say, than in the United States. And uh, in 1976, an important paper came out uh, in uh, Nature by uh, somebody by the name of Hinshaw, Waldo Hinshaw, who happened to be an American working in England. So I went after Hinshaw and I recruited <laughs> Hinshaw to come here. <laughs> so by 1978, we had a laboratory going here in uh, magnetic resonance. And uh, by just within a year or so, we were already producing cross-sectional mm -hmm. images in animal brains and so forth. And the detail was uh, astonishing, I thought. So that uh, by 1980, 81, 82, we were already had a unit producing good images in the head. And then from then on, we continued to develop. But um, the uh, first commercial units uh, became available around 1983 or 84. And since then, of course, the field moved with a great rapidity, right. as you all know. Let's, uh, let's go back to those 1950s again and uh, talk about the training of the neuroradiologist. Now, you were the first full-time neuroradiologist, uh, or the only one at that point. How, how did the training program start? When, when did people start to want to become a subspecialist in neuroradiology? Well, I'll have to say that a number of people were interested in doing this, and I would go to the hospital, and they said, sorry, we have no funding <laughs> for, for that, so therefore, that was not part of the training program, so therefore, we couldn't 
get the people to train. Then the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Blindness, uh, which was the name at the time, was interested in seeing uh, that some people got training. And uh, a few people were sent to Europe to the Serafimer Hospital in uh, Stockholm to train with Dr. Lindgren, mm -hmm. who was uh, there, there. And uh, I uh, uh, was able to uh, be involved in the creation of the first training program funded by the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Blindness uh, in neuroradiology. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Manny Schechter uh, at the Albert Einstein was the second one, uh, both in New York. And um, the uh, idea was that the individual, after he completed his radiology training, could then apply to the NIH and obtain a special training fellowship for two years and to come in to one of these programs to get the training. And uh, I was lucky, it's interesting how very rapidly uh, many young radiologists decided they would like to do this. So the program was filled from almost from the beginning. And uh, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to train some of the uh, early people that uh, became actual uh, leaders later on in the field uh, in the United States. So that um, uh, within four years, I already began to have grandchildren. Well, that, that's what really started the specialty. Yes. You started to train, and, and your, your trainees trained, and that's right. Especially started. So especially really started in 1960 when the first uh, organized training program was put in place. And uh, I'll have to give credit to the NINDB, so-called at that time, uh, for uh, supporting uh, this, creating, shall we say, the uh, accepting the idea and finding the money and, and supporting the young candidates. But I suspect that uh, they also had some stimulus from you to, along those lines, and it was a, a two-pronged effort to put this specially on the map. Now, in 19, early 60s, you also were writing a book, uh, and uh, I believe in the early 60s it was published, and this was really the first uh, book in this country to to be devoted, I believe, entirely to neuroradiology. Uh, we have the, the current volume, two volumes set here. That was a single book, if I remember, uh, kind of a gray color, but uh, that was the classic. And that was, I think, another factor to put the specialty on the map. Uh, in, in writing that book, I believe you wrote it with Dr. Wood? Uh, yes, is that correct? yes, yes. Yeah, that, that yes, I think that, uh, I'll have to say I do take a little credit for what you might call defining what neuroradiology was mm -hmm. at that time. <clears throat> and uh, that was the book. So what people used to say is if it is not in that book, then it must not be neuroradiology. <laughs> it's something else. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other hand, there were things in there which people did not consider a neuroradiology, which became neuroradiology. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, of course, applied to all of our geography, anything that had to do with the nervous system, including the spine, uh, all of the spinal work that uh, related to the nervous system, and uh, things like uh, isotopes, when they dealt with the nervous system, and ultrasound, if you dealt with the nervous system, and so forth. And I think that... Um, that was, uh, that then people could see, ah, I see, well, this is neuroradiology. And I think that tended to consolidate what you might call uh, what was created by the initiation of the training programs. And then this logically led 
to the formation of a society. Just for neurology, you were one of the founding members of that. Uh, uh, was, was there any special stimulus led that, or was it just that now there were a number of people that were wanting to get together to discuss their common interests? When did, and when did that? Uh, well, it, there, there again, that's a, I, um, uh, I was elected president of the uh, World Symposium on Neuroradiology, which was to take place in New York in 1964. And I thought that it was about time that we did something about creating a specialty that might then be represent, representative. And in 1962, I uh, invited 13 other individuals around the United States and Canada who were the only people that were doing neuroradiology at the time. You mean full-time To uh, the full-time, mm -hmm. that has to become, uh, to see whether they would be interested in founding a society. And you know, all 13 came to a meeting in New York, and we founded the society which then was called the American Society of Neuroradiology, and uh, there was 14 founding members. And uh, now we have uh, 1,400 members already. It has grown that much growth. in that period from 62 to now. And uh, it has become an important force, which you might say is similar to what the uh, um, American Society of Neurological Surgeons is now, which started as a Harvey Cushing right, Society. The American Association the of Neurological Surgeons. Yes. Uh, the, now that, uh, that society then, in its natural progression, uh, decided to form a journal, is that uh, uh, Yes, the, uh, the, yeah, the society uh, decided to um, uh, to form a journal. They, uh, there were some members that were extremely enthusiastic about having it, and it was discussed for a while. And I uh, was invited to attend some of the meetings, and I said, a, a new journal for neuroradiology? Well, my goodness, there's so many journals now, but maybe I ought to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so I went there and so forth, and then I decided that perhaps we should have a journal. And uh, they asked me, would you like to be the editor? Well, not me, not me, I'm too busy. <laughs> and again, so I thought, um, and then I came here, and a few days later, I called them up and I said, if you uh, like to put my name there, or consider, I, consider me, I, I will, I'll, be, I'll be happy to consider accepting. So obviously, the following day, I said, I had, <laughs> I had the, the uh, see, I've been elected unanimously to become uh, uh, editor of the, of the journal. Ameri American Journal of Neuroradiology. Now, how did that relate to the other radiology journals? Were they unhappy about that journal coming in? Afraid well, it would take their papers, or uh, what, what, uh, what happened in that regard? Yeah, there, was some, there was some unhappiness, you might say, so much so that the uh, American Journal of Rengenology mm -hmm. proposed that they that we should that they could have we could have a journal that would be part of the American Journal of Rengenology, and then that way the journal could be started and there'd be no problem with finances and so forth. And as a matter of fact, for the first three or four years, the journal was part. Uh, or it was owned by the American Ring and Race Society rather than the American Society of Neuroradiology. And uh, it developed just, just, just fine, except that the society was not too happy with it. And so they decided to separate it from the uh, other society. And uh, yes, that was a very good question that you asked. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, in radiology, um, the general radiologists thought that they would lose control, just like the general surgeons thought that they would lose control if they separated neurosurgery <laughs> from general surgery. <laughs> and it took Harvey Cushing and 
a lot of effort from many people over there to really get that mm -hmm. thing out of general surgery. And um, I think that the, the same has happened with, with neuroradiology. And I, I uh, am now uh, uh, only peripherally involved with the idea of creating a, a, an, an American board of neuroradiology, mm -hmm. just like the, the creation of the American board of neurosurgery, because I think it is really needed if we're going to have really qualified people doing the work. And uh, this is particularly true now that, that the, the field has expanded so much and includes some uh, therapeutic implications in it. Before we leave the journal, uh, most people probably don't know, uh, in the early days, of course, the M MRI was turned, termed NMR, and I believe it was your editorial in one of the issues from the uh, journal that uh, proposed this designation to remove the word nuclear from the, uh, the study because of the worry some people, lay people, had about that that term. It, was that just an idea that came after discussion or you just had that one day or because it's, you know, it's, it's, it, we use that term several times a day, all of us involved in the field. Um, well, yes, I, I thought that the word nuclear was very bad mm -hmm. because um, now here was something finally that didn't have any radiation in it. <clears throat> and then to put the word nuclear in it would be very bad. So I I wrote an editorial that was printed in more than one journal. And that sort of, almost overnight, they changed the, the whole the designation. The designation, yeah. yes. That's sort of quite remarkable. Now, we touched earlier on interventional neuroradiology, and, or surgical neuroradiology, as used by some. Uh, that certainly is now a very rapidly growing field. And, uh, but that, the beginnings of that happened during your uh, active years as well. And would you like to make some general comments about that field? And I know you've had a deep interest in that. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, again, I, I'd like to say that uh, Lesson Hop, the neurosurgeon from Georgetown University, uh, was uh, the, the man who had the idea of um, embolizing some arterial venous malformations. And uh, then he did further work on it. He did not stop in just reporting a case. He did more cases, but in addition to that, he would do some animal research and trying to work on the tolerance of several blood vessels um, to catheterization and, and, and so forth. So he deserves considerable credit uh, because he started in 1960 and it was uh, uh, 1964 before we could see any other authors involved in um, uh, publishing anything related mm -hmm. to interventional. And then um, uh, in 1967, 68, we, uh, there, was, there were two important case reports dealing with transfemoral embolization of arterial venous malformations in the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. and one was by De Quiro and uh, Omaya at, uh, and Dobman at the NIH. And the other one was, was uh, by D Newton and Adams in the um, in, in University of California. That, I think, was an important, uh, were an important publications. And then <clears throat> in 1969, uh, we, Dr. Hilal, uh, the Neurological Institute, uh, was working also on some other developments, including the use of mag magnetic, uh, magnetically guided uh, catheters mm -hmm. to try to navigate through the vessels. And uh, I'll have to say that uh, many people and neuroradiologists became interested in the field uh, at that time. But the most important advance was made by a neurosurgeon, and that was uh, Serbinenko. Serbinenko in, in, uh, in um, Moscow, Russia, who, when he published that paper 
in the Journal of Neurosurgery in 1974, where he described his balloons and the possibility of detaching the balloon from the catheter. That changed the field and opened the thing. And of course, uh, since the neuroradiologists were the ones who have been more adept at handling and uh, developing uh, catheterization uh, in the blood vessels, why it was only natural that we would develop uh, that. And I think that uh, the work has always been stimulated by the uh, neurosurgeons, and they are the ones who have uh, asked that this be continued and developed further. And uh, they, uh, I, and without that, I believe the field would not have been developed. I think that uh, what I'm hoping is that uh, the, the joint uh, development of the field with neuroradiology and neurosurgery working together uh, will uh, cause uh, this to really blossom and reach uh, the, uh, uh, the limits that it, that it should uh, reach. That, that's what we're working for now, and we've had some joint meetings, as you know, uh, between neuroradiology and neurosurgery just to foster that concept. You've uh, had uh, just innumerable awards in your career for your outstanding work. Uh, are there a few that stand out in your mind as, as highlights and ones that meant the most to you? Well, <clears throat> there were, uh, one of them uh, it was an interesting one because it was um, the uh, Andres Bello, B-E-L-L-O, uh, of the government of Venezuela to me. Um, yeah, and um, it is the Andres Bello Order, uh, <clears throat> which is supposed to be a very distinguished uh, order there. And that was given to me by the president of Venezuela himself. Oh my goodness. Which was, I thought it was, and the reason was that I had trained uh, uh, a person who um, went there and uh, uh, was able to de develop some very important things, so I guess that that was the reason uh, for that. Uh, and then there was they uh, named a uh, a section of the department with my name and so forth. But uh, perhaps uh, uh, the ones that I like the most is the fact that I obtained uh, a gold medal from uh, the four associations in radiology. Um, the Radiological Society of North America, the American Ring and Ray Society, the American College of Radiology, and the Association of University Radiologists. <clears throat> and uh, I, as I understand it, there aren't too many radiologists who have received all four societies' recognition at that level. And um, Another one that, uh, that was uh, an interesting one was uh, uh, in Dominican Republic, where I'm a native from there. I received the order of uh, Duarte, Sanchez, and Mella uh, as a knight, and I was elected knight uh, of the order of Sanchez, of uh, Duarte, Sanchez, and Mella. And um, uh, the uh, uh, that is a, uh, a great honor, as I understand it, <clears throat> over there. So, but I can understand that because, after all, I was born there. Although they say that uh, nobody is a prophet in his own country. <laughs> well, those are really very distinguished uh, awards and certainly well deserved. We have a few more uh, minutes. You commented on the future as it relates to interventional neuroradiology. Uh, you want to say a, a few words about your thoughts for the future of neuroradiology in general uh, uh, as, as you see uh, it over the next decade and into the 21st century? Well, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an important question. Um, I wish I could uh, have a crystal ball. Um, 
I think that the uh, development in um, magnetic resonance imaging and in computer tomography will continue, particularly, of course, in magnetic resonance imaging. And um, we wonder whether any other imaging methods will be developed. Now, we do have electron spin resonance, which is another uh, possibility for producing images. <clears throat> it turns out, however, at the present time, that while extremely high detail would be possible with electron spin resonance, nevertheless, the penetration of the electrons may not be sufficient so that we would not be able to go beyond the surface. But conceivably, we could expect to get extremely high detail maps of the brain surface uh, using electron spin resonance imaging in the future. That would require considerable research. My feeling is that we probably, beyond that, will not see any any further new, totally new developments that would be in the imaging field. What we will see, I think, is a uh, uh, increased uh, resolution, uh, decrease in the amount of, uh, uh, of time that it takes to generate the images, and then in magnetic resonance, the use of spectroscopy to obtain some physiological information there. You might say, how about PET scanning? Well, PET scanning is um, another area which, as you well know, since you have been involved in it, we both have been involved in it, uh, <clears throat> has been a long time uh, since they be 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 began developing, and yet, uh, we are still not there in terms of clinical application and so forth. But in the areas of spectroscopy and I think PET scanning, I can see that there is a lot to be done. Well, I want to thank you very much, Juan, for spending this time with us. It's been a great pleasure to have you for this interview. Thank you.